<sighs> Congrats to us on a hundred. <laughs> Feels like only yesterday. <laughs> Truly. Welcome back to Is Fitz Happy. I'm Luke. And I'm Emma. And this week we're discussing chapter 34, Girl on the Dragon. The epigraph of this chapter is discussing the formation of the Coterie and the early days of the what would become a war with right. the Raiders. It discusses how Shrewd and Verity knew immediately, even before it turned into a full-blown war, that just Verity skilling alone would not be enough, and so turned to Galen to create a coterie who adamantly refused until the king ordered him, especially right. when he learned that Fitz was going to be one of the people that he was going to be teaching. So it kind of goes through how he created the coterie, it wasn't loyal, blah blah blah, we've been through all of this, this stuff before, it's a nice little recap of it, and in here it says, In desperation, Verity sought for others trained in the skill who might come to his aid. Although there had been no coteries created in the peaceful years of King Shrewd's reign, Verity reasoned that there might still live men and women trained for coteries before that. Had not the longevity of coterie members always been legendary? Perhaps he could find one who would either help him or be able to train others in the skill. But those efforts availed him nothing. It also says that all of the people ended up being either dead or have just mysteriously vanished. And so Verity is once again left alone to deal with this problem. I think it's really interesting to get this epigraph because it gives us a little bit more insight as to the behind the scenes of what was happening. I think at the time when Fitz was being trained for the coterie that he had barely been mentioning that there were a few more raids than normal but I don't think I guess Verity was skilling in the tower a lot but I don't think that Fitz knew what was coming at that point in time right there was no indication given to him that something serious was on the horizon I don't believe he was too young as well true not fully embroiled in everything yet right but it does go to show how the king is really thinking through there are people at play here who know more than our main character yeah definitely this chapter picks up immediately where the last one left off and fitz hears a cry from the tent that verity and the fool are getting ready in the fool kind of rushes outside and sticks his hand in a bucket of water because he has some silver on his fingers now so we get the magical silver <laughs> yes and it has rubbed off. Kettle immediately comes to him and tells him that, you know, what you're feeling isn't pain. It's just a sensation you've never felt before. You have to calm down and keeping it in water isn't going to help. This is just how it is now. You need to breathe and kind of calms the fool down to make, you know, things a little bit better. But what's done is done. And the fool is going to have this now. This is the chapter of extra snappy kettle. Yes. <laughs> kind of barks at everybody in this chapter. Yes. And it feels very early chapters, mm -hmm. Kettle. <laughs> Bosses Fitz to go take care of Verity while she comforts the fool. Right. Uh, because Fitz does, in the midst of this chaos, ask the fool, does it hurt? Which aggravates Kettle because she's like, don't make him think about pain. <laughs> He's in a volatile state right now. And doesn't need to be thinking about anything. So he is shooed away and will now be helping Verity. And when he comes in, Verity is struggling to get one of Fitz's old shirts on, which the sight makes Fitz sad because in the past, Verity would not have been able to fit into one of his shirts. They just because of the size difference between them. But because he has dwindled so much, he now can fit in Fitz's clothes. And, we see Verity is very sad to have potentially harmed the fool. 
And very conscientious of his hands, he immediately snatches his hands down from in front of him to behind him when Fitz is buttoning up his shirt. And when Fitz goes around the other side of him to comb his hair, Verity snatches his hands from behind him to in front of him just to keep away. It occurs to Fitz here that Verity almost sounds like old Verity when he's asking after the fool and, you know, kind of anxious that he might have hurt him in some way. Right. And Fitz decides to find out what it is that the fool's feeling by asking Verity, what does it feel like to have your (laughs) arm silvered? Because he didn't get the answer from the fool. So Verity tells him that it's like the skill, but more. And (laughs) finds that a reasonable answer. And only then, and it's on my hands and arms instead. Yeah. (laughs) It's the typical last chapter. He's just explaining things and looks at people like they're dumb if they don't get it. Right. So Fitz is still just as clueless. <laughs> he asks a little bit more about the process of him carving his dragon because Fitz asks why he put silver on his arms. So Verity kind of dives into it like, yeah, I, I use it to bring color and find details and bring the stone to life with this. He also makes an interesting comment that I noted that he is just carving away the excess of the stone to reveal the dragon that's within. And this sounds a lot like when in later books, the fool is carving wood. The way the fool talks about wood carving is that the wood has an image in it and that he he is simply bringing it to light. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really interesting that Verity describes this stone carving in a similar fashion because it makes me wonder if he had to search for the perfect stone. Like if he, you know, was feeling out stones and one specifically called to him and then it made his dragon. I don't know. know, But I like it. I like the imagery a lot. So I wanted to (laughs) bring it forward. He then, meaning Verity, kind of changes topic and asks if Ketrikin is angry with him. My lord king, it is not for me to say. Verity, he interrupted wearily, call me Verity, and for Edith's sake, answer the question, Fitz. He sounded like his old self so much I wanted to embrace him. Instead, I said, I do not know if she is angry. She is definitely hurt. She came a long and weary way to find you, bearing terrible news. And you did not seem to care. I care when I think of it, he said gravely. When I think of it, I grieve. But there are so many things I must think of, and I cannot think of them all at once. I knew when the child died, Fitz, how could I not know? He, too, and all I felt, I have put into the dragon. So Fitz doesn't understand this part, but we do as rereaders, and that is extremely heartbreaking because it's something obviously he felt a lot, but also I'm imagining him feeling that and being like, well, I have to kind of get rid of this feeling right? to it's, keep going. Yeah, it's so sad. Also, he had to bear that news alone and in the middle of nowhere, there's no one there to comfort him and... I think that would be really hard news to have to live through in normal circumstances, but especially I'm sure the hurt that he would feel that he can't be there to comfort Ketrikin even. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he just had to keep moving forward and it's very heartbreaking. So he walks slowly out of the tent, stooped because Fitz thinks of him as an old man now, older than Chade, it seems like. And he talks to Ketrikin. I do want to say that the line... Fitz uses to say he's older than Chade somehow. There's a truth to it. I just don't understand it. It was really interesting to me because I'm wondering if maybe Verity really is like aged up. I'm wondering, I mean, I guess I don't know how this works, but I was wondering if maybe the act of putting yourself into this skill dragon ages you. I mean, it seems like you lose... I guess your vitality, for lack of a better word, or you transfer your life over into it. Right. So you're kind of losing some of that youthful exuberance, if that's (laughs) the way it works in this world. 
So, I, I mean, I can definitely see that him being aged up because of this, or at least his energy levels and, you know, him being malnourished as well. The, just right. the physical privations that he's been through have aged him as well. But I, I could see some something in the magic. Right. I guess I didn't think about the levels of excitement because we know that very recently Jade has been very high level energy. <laughs> right. So I could see how that juxtaposed with Verity, who used to be that way and is now kind of a doddering person, <laughs> is seen as older than Jade. Verity comes out and makes a half-hearted gesture and kind of apology. He says, "I, if I could, I would embrace you, but you have seen that my touch, he gestured at the fool and let his words trail away. I had seen the look on her face when she had told Verity about the stillbirth. I expected her to turn aside from him, to hurt him as he had hurt her. But Ketrickin's heart was larger than that. Oh, my husband, she said, and her voice broke on the words. He held his silvered arms wide, and she came to him, taking him in her embrace. He bowed his gray head over the rough gold of her hair, but could not allow his hand to touch her. He turned his silvered cheek away from her. They share a private moment where... He asks about the name of the child, and she says it was sacrifice. And Kettle then rebukes Fitz because Fitz is just kind of being a voyeur here and looking in on their private moment. Right. Which is very Fitz. <laughs> Did not necessarily... Kind of unaware of the... <laughs> yeah, not recognize the social faux pas of watching this scene unfold without having external <laughs> just wants the tea you know yeah he wants, to, see <laughs> he wants to know but it is a really heartbreaking moment because there's still part of verity in there that very clearly is feeling something that right. is trying to comfort his wife the best that he can with what is left of him as a person and it's so very sad, and they both cry here. They're mm -hmm. embracing each other the best they can, and they both cry. And I think as sad as it is, it's nice to see them be able to share this moment together. Yeah, cathartic for both of them and for the reader. Right. <laughs> we don't have to leave it at Verity just saying, oh. <laughs> it can <laughs> right. be he's saddened by the name of his child. And I don't know. I just appreciate that that's there because it very easily could have been left without but i don't know i i think verity's a good guy ultimately so it's nice to yeah <laughs> have a little bit of redemption <laughs> so kettle shoes fits away and they kind of gather around the fire where the fool is you know very preoccupied with his silvered fingers he asks why does it cling to my fingers it doesn't rub off on anything else and Kettle replies, it's because you're alive. And Fitz has to, of course, chime in and be like, well, Verity told me he shapes rocks with it because of the, the skill on them. And Kettle again has to rebuke him, like, you're talking too much. Don't give him any ideas, basically. Right. <laughs> and Fitz won't lay down and take that. He says, perhaps I would not talk too much if you spoke a bit more, I replied. Rock is not alive. She looked at me. You know that, do you? Well, what is the point of my talking when you already know everything? She attacked her food as, as if it had done her a personal wrong. <laughs> it's funny, but it's also very frustrating because yes. once again, Kettle is not talking when she should be to mm -hmm. help the group. It's, I don't know, I guess old ha habits die hard. She's been on her own for so long, it would be hard to trust anybody i guess i don't know if trust is really the right word but just well and it's you know she was exiled exiled from her coterie she was a royal coterie member and learned the skill and if it is even somewhat like it was today where fitz was struggling to talk in front of people about the magic right. like she would be like i don't think i should speak on this you know i guess i guess my train of thought is i don't think she was there when it was exiled to be taught to anyone but royalty so it feels like i mean maybe it's always been super secretive we find out later there are locks on some of the skill scrolls so maybe it is maybe it's mm -hmm. a very like you can know base level things but you're not allowed to share anything yeah. besides that i don't know 
certain knowledge is kept hidden until you're ready. Yeah. And this feels like very advanced. <laughs> Fair. Starling comes over then, sits down beside Fitz, her plate on her knees, and said, I don't understand what the silvery stuff on his hands. What is it? The fool snickered into his plate like a naughty child when Kettle glared at her. <laughs> <laughs> and Fitz asks again, what does it feel like? Mm -hmm. Fitz is very intrigued by what the feeling could possibly be, which I appreciate because I am also very curious. Fool just kind of describes it as very sensitive. You can feel the weave of the threads and the bandages. And then he goes over this little paragraph of where these came from, like going back in time, tracing the history of the cloth to the sheep to, you know, the grass that the sheep ate and kind of back and back and back. And Kettle has to rebuke him and say, stop it because She's worried about him getting lost in all of those memories. Right. Just kind of says, eat your food. <laughs> <laughs> and then Starling asks how she knows so much about the skill. <laughs> Not you too, Kettle angrily de declared. Is there nothing private anymore? Among us? Not much, the fool replied. But he was not looking at her. He was watching Ketcherkin, her face still puffy from weeping as she dished up food for herself and Verity. Her worn and stained clothing, her rough hair and chapped hands, and the simple, homely tasks she performed for her husband should have made her seem like any woman. But I looked at her and saw perhaps the strongest queen that Buckkeep had ever known. Just a very sweet sentiment. Yes. One that I, I like to point out when Fitz has these because, again, yes, he admires Ketchikin, but I think it's more than just like... She's a uh, strong queen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you go, girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there. I don't know if this is. I don't think he's looking at her with like romantic thoughts right now or anything. I just think his admiration and his uh, general well, his general goodwill towards her is deeper than just a. We're friends. Plain friendship sure. or like sure. she's my queen. So that's fair. He's also watching Verity as he takes the wooden spoon and dish and winces and kind of puts two and two together like, oh, this is what Verity goes through as well. Every single time he touches something, he sees the history of it. Right. And he kind of has to brace himself against those thoughts and that pull. Verity starts eating and kind of his body recalls to him, oh, you are hungry. You never eat. <laughs> so he attacks the food ravenously. And Kettle kind of agrees with the fool's earlier sentiment. No, there's not much privacy. And with this, the group decide, uh, starts discussing what the next steps are. Starling immediately goes to, we'll have to get him to jean -Pay. Do we think he needs a few days to recover? Or can we just go right away? And Kettle says, we're not going back to jean -Pay. He has started this dragon. He has to stay here. This is what must be done. And this kind of confuses the group and kind of makes Fitz a little frustrated. He He's, or I guess it's Starling that vocalizes, there's a war going on right now and people are dying. We can't leave the rightful king here. Yeah, we he, should just help him carve a dragon. <laughs> yeah, like that's a little bit of a waste of time, don't you think? And Kettle says, no, it's what's going to help save the six duchies and the mountains. It's exactly what we need to do. And then she excuses herself to make more meat because the king seems like he needs it. Yeah. Fitz kind of agrees and says we should cook it all. So he, he spends the next hour or so butchering <laughs> the rest of the pig and the stuff. But, and that kind of removes that conversation from the table. They yes. split up. I think this is another point where it would be helpful if Kettle could just tell everybody why he needs to stay here. Yeah. I, I think there would be less frustration. But also, on the other hand, what good is bringing Verity back now in the state that he's in, I guess? Because, yes, he's the rightful king, but is anybody going to accept the way Verity is now? And he already had a bad reputation before. I just don't know that it makes sense to bring him back, even if this wasn't, like, <laughs> the best choice. Mm -hmm. I don't. I think that the way Verity is now is not someone who could rule over a king. No, no. Definitely not. 
Fitz kind of describes the camp, how people are sitting in their little vignettes doing their various tasks, Faraday and Ketrick and talking, the fool going over and touching different things with his skill fingers. And Kettle is scowling at him. He was saying he was being careful, and Kettle, of course, saying, you have no idea how to be careful. Well, no, you've lost your way until you're gone. And all the while, Night Eyes is eating all of the, <laughs> the scraps that Fitz can give him. Right. Eventually, they start to settle in for bed. Ketrikin rummages through their tent stuff, grabs her bedding, moves it into Verity's tent, and catches Fitz's eyes because Fitz had a quick glance over there, and she unabashedly kind of confronts him and says, Hey, I took your long mittens from your pack, just so you know. Yeah. Goes into the tent. Which makes the fool and Fitz both feel awkward, so they... Don't know where to look. It should also be mentioned that Ketrikin, or I'm sorry, Kettle and Starling are not here in this moment. They are off getting firewood, so they did not Mm -hmm. witness this embarrassing exchange. (laughs) (laughs) Fitz goes back to carving up the meat to prepare that so they have, so it doesn't spoil for the future. And the fool walks over to him and starts up a conversation about how when he touched Verity's arm with his hand, how he knew the plan, how he knew Verity down to his bones, and how through that he knows that Verity is a worthy king to serve, as worthy as Shrewd was for the fool. And also how thinking through all that was too much at first to grasp, but and it kind of took some time to put it into place in his mind. But he understands now what this is. He says, The dragons are the elderlings, the fool said softly, but Verity could not wake them. So he carves his own dragon, and when it is finished, he will waken it, and then he will go forth to fight the red ships, alone. Alone. That word struck me. Once again, Verity expected to fight the red ships alone. But there was too much I didn't quite grasp. All the elderlings were dragons, I asked. My mind went back to all the fanciful drawings and weavings of elderlings I had ever seen. Some had been dragon-like, but... No, the elderlings are dragons. Those carved creatures back in the stone garden. Those are the elderlings. King Wisdom was able to wake them in his time, to rouse them and recruit them to his cause. They came to life for him, but now they either sleep too deeply or they are dead. Verity spent much of his strength trying to rouse them in every way he could think of, and when he could not, he decided that he would have to make his own elderling and quicken it and use it to fight the red ships. So I just kind of want to go over that information. This is the fool knowing Verity's mind and understanding all of this from Verity's point of view. We know a lot of this information is flawed. Right. It is presented like this is the de facto, like this is what is real. Yes. These are the facts. And a lot of this is kind of confusing to me. One, because the fool uses King Wisdom as like an example. Meanwhile, Kettle mentioned that it took like a whole coterie to make one. I don't know. I guess it kind of fits in. It's just they have a little bit of information on King Wisdom that was spoken in front of all of them. That doesn't fully mesh with what's going on here. Right. They also don't think it through of like, okay, then if they were able to wake him up, where did they go? Right. (laughs) For like their later conclusions. Yeah, it's definitely this interesting conversation where the only thing we have to go on is secondhand knowledge that clearly Verity didn't really have all of in the first place. So this is everything that he has come to his own conclusions on. Yes. And it's fairly close. Yeah, it is really close. I mean, it's better than Fitz has been doing. So, (laughs) so I guess, but it's still not quite right. And it's hard for Fitz to grasp this concept anyway, but as a reader, it's really interesting. I guess as a rereader, it's really interesting to get to come across this again to know what is right and what is wrong. Because I believe my first time through, I was like, oh, this makes so much sense. I totally believe this. This is clearly I, right. I remember you kind of having that conclusion and like talking to me because you had, you know, guesses of what 
actually was real. Right. And then you read it and you're like, oh, this kind of fits pretty closely. I was like somewhat right. I'm like, (laughs) sure. (laughs) Yeah, almost. (laughs) But it is really fun to get to read it as a rereader to only if only to note all the differences of Mm -hmm. what is correct and not. Fitz, of course, has a lot of questions about this, asking how it's done. And the fool has to reply, I don't know, and I don't think Verity does either. He's just kind of blundering into it. And Fitz gets, understandably, pretty upset, just saying, like, so this is what we came all this way for, for stone to rise up, fly away, and defend our lands? Like, this is unbelievable. There's no way this happens. Why am I here? Right. Is it also going to go after Regal and his troops at the mountain border? Like, is this going to solve every magical problem? This isn't something a child would believe. Mm -hmm. Why are you trying to make me believe it? The fool looked mildly affronted. Believe it or not, as you choose. I but know that Verity believes it. Unless I am much mistaken, Kettle believes it as well. Why else would she insist we must stay here and help Verity complete the dragon? For a time I pondered this. Then I asked him, Your dream about Realdir's dragon, what do you recall of it? He gave a helpless shrug. The feelings of it, mostly. I was exuberant and joyful. For not only was I announcing Realdir's dragon, but he was going to fly me on it. I felt I was a bit in love with him, you know. That sort of lift to the heart. But, he faltered, I cannot recall if I loved Realdir or his dragon. In my dream, they are mingled, I think. Recalling dreams is so hard. One must seize them as soon as one wakes and quickly repeat them to oneself to harden the details. Otherwise, they fade so quickly. They go into a little more of a conversation about real dragons here, but real dude's dragon, the, that's kind of the key component that they're missing, that real dude's dragon is both. It was real dude, and it's also the dragon because real dude carved a dragon yes so that would probably be why there's this feeling of intermingling between yes. realder and realder's dragon mm-hmm. which is actually a really cute little like nod and tip of the hat by robin hobb for rereaders because on your first time through it's just a weird detail of like oh it's probably just because it's a dream but when you're a rereader you know probably because they're like one and the same the feelings for realer are mingled because yeah they're the same person yeah (laughs) but it also gives a glimpse into what it was like back in the day to have somebody creating one of those dragons it was a celebrated thing it was a full ceremony it was right an honor almost and definitely an honor to be flown on one of them right yeah so it's it's very interesting peek into what it was like for elderlings to carve them because we know, you know, for skill users, at least for the far seers, it's a last ditch effort <laughs> for right. defense. Right. Although, would Realder's dragon be an elderling, or is that also part of Fitz's ancestry? No, I think Realder's dragon would be. They were elderlings. I'm pretty sure. I think that was from the old civilization that was there. They carved, you know. They had that village there along the road and all that sort of stuff. Interesting. I could be wrong. Well, it seems like this was a regular practice for a really long time, so I could see it that it's like still within the past of the sixth century, especially if all of the That's fair. paths are still there. Wasn't th- Realder part of a coterie? So it would have to be skill users in some capacity? Right. Yeah. I just think that there's a chance that the village was, you know, not as old as the other civilizations because it's still kind oh, of yeah. there. Definitely. Like, yeah, there's a long period of time. It definitely could be. Yes. Mm-hmm. Especially since there's like vague things of foundations, but none of it was made by the skill stone itself. Right. So that kind of lends credence to that a little bit. So they move on a little bit from stone dragons and continue on to the topic of real dragons. Fitz says, then maybe it has nothing to do at all with what Verity does. Perhaps in the time from which your dream came, there were real dragons of flesh and blood, speaking of the fool's vision with Realder's dragon. Yes. He looked at me curiously. 
You do not believe there are real dragons today? I have never seen one. In the city, he pointed out quietly. That was a vision of a different time, you said today. He held up one of his own pale hands to the firelight. I think they are like my kind. Rare, but not mythical. Besides, if there were no dragons of flesh and blood and fire, whence would the idea for these stone carvings? So we have a, a little bit of a, a conversation there, which is interesting again as a rereader, because the fool isn't incorrect here in that they are rare, like one of his kind, but there right. are more whites in the world than there are dragons ever. <laughs> right. <laughs> The only one alive today is Ice Fire. Yes, and he is slowly dying in the mm -hmm. ice. <laughs> there are still the cocoons of Wizardwood that wakens uh, Tintaglia later, and there's still the serpents. Right. But Ice Fire is the only dragon right now. Yeah. I think it's interesting to see more of what the fool is believing, though. We get this little insight into what goes on in his mind and how he's thinking about this. Because he is very interested in bringing dragons back. That's his so, whole goal, yeah. So it's interesting that I think if you come at it from that place of he believes he's the one that's going to bring dragons back, it's interesting to believe that then he has to have some sort of hope that dragons are still around. Right. Because how do you right. bring back an extinct species? Mm -hmm. But also this trying to grapple on to, well, then maybe they're not like we remember them and i don't think that these stones are what they are what i'm supposed to bring back but maybe it is it's really interesting and then also getting fitz's point of view as someone who doesn't necessarily believe in dragons to that all of this is just so out of his capacity for believing that he's flabbergasted yeah definitely it's very very confusing for poor old fitz <laughs> and he doesn't want to have it anymore he's tired of going around in circles and having riddles he just wants to know what is and so they stop their conversation and Fitz continues on with cutting meat he tries to needle Kettle into talking to him but it evolved into a lecture of how to take care of the fool and being more careful of the fool and how the fool had to sleep on his back and not touch anything and all of this sort of stuff. He was not due to take his watch for a while because after a while they have to go to bed. Right. And he's sleeping and the wolf wakes him up. And he says, Ketrickin walks alone, weeping. I doubted she would want my company. I also doubted that she should be alone. So he gets out of bed, passes Kettle and says, I'm going to go find Ketrickin. And Kettle thinks that's probably a good idea. She had said that she was going to go look. Ketrickin had said she was going to go look at the dragon that Verity had carved, but it had been a long time. So at least Fitz knows the direction to go. <laughs> he goes through the quarry alone at night. It's really spooky. I well, guess he's not alone. Night Eyes is night leading is. him. Yeah, they're one in the same thing. <laughs> and it's not towards Verity's dragon. It's away from it. Yes. Uh, as he goes, he gets more and more nervous because they're starting to get really close to the skill pillar. And that's dangerous because obviously the coterie could be there or could come out of there at any moment. But before he gets too close, he is stopped by the sight of Ketrickin and Girl on Dragon. Yeah, she's on top of the block with her hand on the uh, mired leg or some such or flank of the this statue. And she is crying. Night Eyes patted lightly up, leaped weightlessly upon the dais, and leaned his head against Ketrickin's leg with a tiny whine. Hush, she told him softly. Listen, can you hear her weeping? I can. I did not doubt it, for I could feel her questing out with the wit, more strongly than I had ever sensed it from her before. My lady, I said quietly. She startled, her hand flying to her mouth as she turned to me. I think that's interesting because it goes to show how close that Ketrickin and Night Eyes have gotten. Yeah, and how like using the wit has strengthened it for her a bit. Yes, yeah, because she's talking and at first it could be like she's talking out loud so that Fitz can hear. 
it's not it's two night eyes but it could also be towards fitz mm-hmm. and then she is surprised because fitz is there which also is interesting because she is using the wit really strongly so you'd think she'd feel his presence but i guess if it's all focused on this like figuring out what's going on with girl and dragon well also she isn't like she isn't strongly enough with it to be like with it you know i don't I think she knows that she has that life sense or anything probably can't actively use it it took a while for fitz to get used to that so fair fair I feel like she would actually have to be told and then taught directly what she's doing. <laughs> right. Well, to be fair, I think Fitz does it naturally because he doesn't notice he does it until the yeah. forged ones. Mm-hmm. So, but she is questing towards the girl on dragon, which I think is really interesting because Fitz talked earlier about how the sense coming from girl on dragon is so melancholy and sad and, it's just like such an uncomfortable feeling but he didn't mention anything about somebody crying and so i wonder if it's easier for ketrican to pick that out because of what she's going through if that's like i don't know ringing on her consciousness more yeah like attracts to like right or if she's i mean she is directly touching the statue as well so that true probably helps Fitz begs her pardon for startling her, but he says that, you know, we shouldn't be alone in Kettle agrees. We shouldn't be alone out here. We're really close to where the Coterie could get us because the skill pillar is not far. She smiled bitterly. Wherever I am, I am alone. Nor can I think of anything they could do to me worse than what I have done to myself. Fitz asks her to come back to camp and she moves, but not to step down to Fitz. Instead, she's leaning back against the dragon, and Fitz's wit sense of the dragon girl's misery was echoed by Ketrikins. So I think you're you're correct in saying that kind of they're mirroring each other here, at least a little bit. Ketrikin says, I just wanted to lie beside him, to hold him, and to be held, to be held, Fitz, to feel not safe. I know none of us are safe. But to feel valued, loved. I did not expect more than that. But he would not. He said he could not touch me, that he dared not touch anything live save his dragon. She turned her head aside. Even with his hands and armed gloves, he would not touch me. Fitz climbs up next to her and kind of puts his arm around her shoulders and tries to comfort her a bit. Right. And this is really sad because... This is another, again, <laughs> uh, moment when Ketrikin doesn't have the depth of knowledge that Fitz and Verity do to understand why his hesitation is there. It's overcautiousness from Verity's side, for sure, but I'm sure he would rather be overcautious than careless, especially with someone he loves so dearly. But it doesn't feel that way to Ketrikin. And so it's hard for her to understand. Yeah. And and Fitz is trying to comfort her saying like, he would if he could. I know he would if he could. But that just drives home the earlier point of, you know, the the contention point between them where he, where Fitz has extra feeling and extra knowledge of Verity that she cannot grasp. Right. She starts crying and through her tears telling him, you and your skill, and him, you speak so easily of knowing what he feels, of love. But I, I don't have that. I'm only, I need to feel it fits. I need to feel his arms about me to be close to him, to believe he loves me as I love him. After I have failed him in so many ways, how can I believe when he refuses to even... I put my arms around her and drew her head down on my shoulder while Night Eyes leaned up against both of us and keened softly. He loves you, I told her. He does, but fate has laid this burden upon both of you. It must be born. Sacrifice, she breathed. And Fitz does what a good friend does and just holds her, comforts her while she weeps. Yes, gives her a shoulder to cry on. Mm -hmm. I think... 
it really drives home the point to the reader that Ketrickin does not have this level of understanding that Fitz does, and it brings a lot of sympathy towards her. Not that I need to have any more sympathy, you know, like <laughs> she definitely is deserving of sympathy anyway, but I think it's good for anyone who would up until this point be like, come on, Ketrickin, can't you just trust Fitz? It's a good reminder that we are living through Fitz's head. So of course we know that you can trust Fitz and that what he's saying is real. And that's really how the skill works, but she doesn't have that. And so to have this heartbreaking moment is nice to give Kettle that or Ketrickin back a little bit of that understanding of this is why mm -hmm. she I mean she's struggling through the sorrow of losing a child and she doesn't feel worthy of her husband's love and he can't reassure her in a way that she needs because of the choices he's made yeah so very sad heartbreaking situation but Fitz is there giving the best comfort that he can and he realizes it's not just him physically holding her but it's also the wit as much as the words. The feeling I had for her had mingled with the wolves and joined us. Gentler than a skill bond, more warm and natural, I held her in my heart as much as in my arms. Ned Ice pressed up against her, telling her he would guard her, that his meat would ever be her meat, that she need fear nothing that had teeth, for we were pack and always would be. It was she who finally broke the embrace. She gave a final, shuddering sigh, then stepped apart from me. Her hand rose to smear the wetness on her cheeks. Oh, Fitz, she said simply, sadly. And that was all. Fitz kind of stepped in, and without him meaning to replace Verity, replaced Verity for what right. she needed at that moment. Somebody to hold her, and that feeling of love. Yes what she has been craving. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it came out of any place of him thinking like, oh yeah, no, I'm yeah, take definitely over. not. But it just... I think when she realized that's what was going on is when she stepped away because it, it would be so nice to get that comfort after all the time, but also realizing who everybody is and the situation they're in, it probably felt a little bit like she couldn't really continue to accept that. <laughs> But I'm glad she at least gets some comfort and she is not the only one getting comfort because mm -hmm. as she steps away, there is a loneliness and chill, not just from her absence, but that he is feeling emanating from Girl and Dragon behind them. A sudden pang of loss assailed me. The girl on the dragon had shared our embrace, her wit, misery, briefly consoled by our closeness. And then as they drew apart, the chill wailing grew louder and stronger again. He jumps down from the dais, but kind of staggers, and he realizes that somehow that joining had drawn strength from him. So this is a little hint for the future that wit is needed to wake the dragons, mm -hmm. the stone dragons. <laughs> and... It's very scary. It's to Fitz, especially because he doesn't really understand what these beings are. And I, it would be terrifying. It's the middle of the night. Right. And all of a sudden you hear really strong, loud wailing and your energy has been depleted. So it's really a weird situation to find himself in. <laughs> he slowly accompanies back or Ketrickin back to the camp and just in time to relieve Kettle on watch, where the Fool is also up for watch, so it's Fitz and the Fool awake. Night Eyes follows Ketrickin into the tent, and Fitz is definitely fine with him doing that to give her comfort. Right. She needs him more than he does. Mm-hmm. And the Fool is picking things up with his fingers, testing out his new abilities here. He picks up uh, some wood, straightens out and says, quiet and lovely, some 40 years of growing, winter and summer, storm and fair weather, and before that, it was born as a nut by another tree, and so the thread goes back over and over. I do not think I need fear much from natural things, only those that have been wrought by man, 
then the threads go raveling out. But trees, I think, will be pleasant to touch. Fitz half-heartedly kind of says, hey, Kettle said. Don't touch live <laughs> things. <laughs> and the fool is like, well, Kettle doesn't have to live with this, so I need to find out my limits, which makes a ton of sense, and which is what makes Kettle's response to everything frustrating, because the fool does have it on his fingers. She kind of just said, hey, it's not pain, it's a new sensation, deal with it. Also, don't touch anything. And I'm not going to give you any more information than that. Oh, yeah, don't try to rub it off because it's with you forever. It's part of you. Don't touch anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. Cool. Thanks. He makes uh, makes Fitz laugh with a very crude joke and gesture about things that he should be able to touch. And they, at least the, the fool gets some comfort out of that. Right. That they, he's able to, still able to make Fitz laugh. Yes, they both had a little laugh together. Mm-hmm. And then asks where he went just a little bit ago. I could feel something of what happened. Where did you go? There was much I did not understand. And Fitz replies, the skill bond between us may be growing stronger instead of weaker. I do not think that is a good thing. All the elf bark is gone, so he can't douse himself anymore. And the fool is definitely picking up more more vibes, I guess, yeah. <laughs> from Fitz. Yeah, you could kind of tell what was going on, which is really interesting. Because I don't think the fool is, like, actively searching out that feeling. And clearly Fitz is so used to having someone ride along in his consciousness that he did not even notice the fool was along with them in some capacity. But it is a connection that they share and continue to share going forward. I think late in later books, fool talks about being with Fitz. I think in the next trilogy, when they meet up again, he says that he was with Fitz the whole time and Fitz had no way of telling. Mm -hmm. So they have this bond now and Fitz begins to kind of describe what happened. Yeah. The fool is asking pointed questions and wants details about what actually you know, happened with the girl on the dragon and then suggests to go see her. Why? I asked warily. He lifted his right hand and waggled his silver fingertips at me as he lifted one eyebrow. No, I said firmly. Afraid? He needled me. We are on watch here, I told him severely. Then you will go with me tomorrow, he suggested. It is not wise, fool. Who knows what effect it might have on you? Not I, and that is exactly why I wish to do it. Besides, what call has a fool to be wise? No. Then I shall have to go alone, he said with a mock sigh. I refused to rise to the bait. After a moment, he asked me, What is it you know about Kettle that I do not? I looked at him uncomfortably. About as much as I know about you that she does not. Ah, that was well spoken. Those words could have been stolen from me, he conceded. Do you wonder why the Coterie has not tried to attack us again, he asked next. And Fitz has to reply, is this your night for unfortunate questions? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because he kind of continues on the conversation. Uh, of course, they're afraid of the Coterie here. But Fitz is hoping they're weakened a bit yeah. by Carrot's death, which I believe is true because any death in a Coterie that, you know, tight knit would hurt. Right. And that's like best case scenario yeah. if it's his mind. It's just this, the pain of losing a Coterie member is gonna enough to stop them for a bit. And what he fears, he tells the fool, is that they're setting a trap for them, but also going to seek Molly. This has fool questioning, well, can't you just warn her through mm -hmm. the skill? Which is wild to me that he's asking this. This stuck out to me because he was present for all of the conversations that they had on the skill road. Yeah. This this does not make sense to me, and I think it's it has to be an error to get the conversation moving past this point a little bit more. Like, I, I, I'm thinking that it's more along the lines of it's supposed to be like kind of a hint at the reader that something is wrong with that, as if we didn't know already that the meeting with the fool by the hot tub right. was weird. Like now we have this conversation about Molly and it is not at all like the one that was held yeah. in the water. 
and he is asking weird questions, not weird questions. He's just, he's asking questions that feel like he should know the answer to because of the previous conversation. And so it is weird that he asks, like, why can't you just kill to her with all the knowledge? Like, that's the base minimum that they know. Like, that's the reason why Ketrickin couldn't be consoled by Verity via skill. Because yeah. she would be in danger. Like, I don't know. It is really weird. I don't know why. It's, it just sticks out to me so much in this reread through, especially with what we've been talking about. Like right. you said, the the skill thing with Ketrickin and Verity and also everything that fits is purposely not skilling back again and you know? with their ugh, with their bond and the whole like emphasis the past three weeks have been on like don't get too close to the fool because he might be attacked by the skill and give up molly's location and there's no like yeah obviously skill has some danger and usage to it <laughs> i don't know yeah weird But that gets Fitz to explain a little bit more of why he's not skilling pretty much everything that we've mentioned. But Fitz also says, you know, he may not know where she is. You said that Che doesn't even know exactly where she is. And he has a bunch of things on his mind. So why would he go after one, you know, one girl? And the fool has to remind him it's one girl and a farcier child. And... He gets into the conversation then, the fool does, of what happened when they were in his mind. The coterie was in his mind. About Regal's hatred and his plans and and his motivations. This is the chapter of kind of lore dumping right. of what all the rereaders know. But the first time readers through are like, oh my gosh. It's way worse than we thought. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is the fool's description of Regal. The man is mad. He ascribes to you every evil ambition he can imagine. Your wit he regards with loathing and terror. He cannot conceive that what you do, you do for verity. In his mind, you have devoted your life to injuring him since you came to Buckkeep. He believes that both verity and you have come to these mountains not to wake the elderlings to defend Buck, but to find some skill, treasure, or power to use against him. He believes he has no choice but to act first, to find whatever it is you seek and turn it against you. To that he bends all his resources and determination. Fitz asks why he hasn't spoken of this before, and the fool has to say it's you know, not something I like recalling, because they were in his mind like evil, idle children smashing what they could not grasp. I could keep nothing back from them, but they were not interested in me at all. They regarded me as less than a dog. Angry in that moment of finding I was not you. They nearly destroyed me because I was not you. Then they considered how they might use me against you. In this telling of the fool of why he hasn't said anything yet, there's also descriptions of him having trembling hands. He has goosebumps. He's shaking. He is recalling things as a man who has been tortured does. So... There is a sense of why (laughs) the fool hasn't really thought on it too hard. Right. But it is still a little bit like, "Mm, this feels like important information you maybe should have (laughs) said even a little bit of before now. And that's why I think Fitz says he feels like Chade, as he said quietly. Now I will turn that back upon them. They could not hold you in thrall like that without revealing much of themselves to you. As much as you can, I ask you to reach back to that time and tell me all you can recall. He would not ask that if you knew what you were asking. I thought I did know, but I refrained from saying it. So he feels like this is important information. Yes. I need it, but also I'm using you as a tool to get that information. I feel bad, but like we need it. Right. It's really interesting that he ascribes himself as being very Chade like here and uses a lot of the same sort of techniques that Chade has used on him in the past to get him to talk about things that were uncomfortable. Staying silent. Yes. Telling him what he wants and then letting him do the rest of the work. It's so interesting to see this because Fitz is so anti becoming Chade. 
<laughs> and then in this moment, that's exactly what he does. It- he verbally or I guess mentally says to himself that he doesn't want to become like Jade, but he still, as we know, he, he acts like him a lot, especially in this scene. Yes. But also he's always looked up to him as well. Right. <laughs> so right. it's kind of a little, I don't know, clash of it's, thoughts in his head. It is really interesting, though, to see this version of Fitz that he doesn't become and that he probably would have got more into personality wise if he would have went back to Buckkeep at the end of this cha- or the end of this book. Yeah. That he probably would have become Jade's tool <laughs> to or a tool to be used by the Farseer throne in the same way Jade is. Yeah, he, I mean, he would have had to be in hiding. Chade came out of hiding and would be the advisor, but Fitz was still dead. Right. He was still, you know, the witted bastard who murdered the king. Yeah. So he couldn't come back to life. But if he did go back to Buckkeep, he would have been probably in Chade's old study for 15 years afterwards. Yeah. Working for the good of the throne. Weird to think about. But it is also sad that Fitz knows that what he's doing is hard on the fool. And I believe when fool says, like, if you knew what you're asking, you wouldn't ask me to do that. He's saying, like, you're making me recall horrible, torturous memories. Not just like, these are bad thoughts. It's like, this is me reliving torture to give you this information. And Fitz is like, yeah, okay. (laughs) But that probably yeah. yeah stems from how he's been treated he probably doesn't really think much of it he's like well the ends justify the means in the end that's just how it is like he said i thought i did know but i refrained from saying that so yeah. it's like him recalling everything in ketrickin's throne room or whatever in that right. sitting room yeah, yeah. And it's sad <laughs> the fool goes on to say this whole lore dump here of there were other skill books you know, books and scrolls that Galen removed from Solicity's room as she was dying. The information they held was for a skill master alone, and some were even fastened shut with clever locks. Galen, of course, had a lot of years to, to open those up and read them and translate them, and he found a lot there that he didn't understand, but there were also scrolls listing those who had been skill trained. So this is where the missing skill users comes in because Galen sought out all of those that he could find and questioned right. them. And then he did away with them, lest others should ask the same questions he had. Galen found much in those scrolls, how a man might live long and enjoy a good health, how to give pain with a skill without even touching a man. But in the oldest scrolls, he found hints of great power awaiting a strongly skilled man in the mountains. If Regal could bring the mountains under his sway, he could come into power no one could withstand. To what end did he seek to that end he, did he seek the hand of Ketrikin for Verity with no intent that she would ever be his bride? He intended that when Verity was dead, he would take her in his brother's stead and her inheritance. Which is speaking of the the elder the, the elderlings, quote unquote, the carved stone dragons. Yes. But they didn't know that because it's not detailed out in the scrolls. Or at least Galen was not saying that to Regal. Right. Galen does know, but he does not tell Regal. It's it's hard to tell from these passages if it's actually laid out in those skill scrolls in explicit detail or if it's just hinted at and he told Regal there's great power and he knew a little bit more. It's really hard to say. Because I I don't think it says in here anywhere that they knew explicitly it was carving a stone dragon with skilled ones to get, like, a weapon or something. Right. The fool's whole thing is, like, Regal thinks that there's power or a great treasure of skill users can use and stuff. And he also goes on to explain that after Galen died, Regal got the scrolls and had time to translate these things. And that's when he found out that it was related to the Elderlings after Verity had already gone on his journey. Right. It also talks a little bit about how when Regal, the reason Regal didn't know before Galen died is because Galen needed leverage over Regal, that if he knew that if he gave everything to Regal all in one go, there would be no more need for him. <laughs> so to rein yeah. his brother in, he kept some secrets close to his chest. And then... 
when Regal did inherit the new scrolls, he is not very good at reading other languages. So he was really struggling to figure it out. That's why there's so much time between when Galen dies and Mm -hmm. when Verity goes where Regal has no idea because he's too embarrassed to ask for help. And he doesn't trust anybody that would help him to just give him the answer. So he had to suss it out for himself. And when he does, it's too late. Which also gives us the timeline. I know we've talked about this, I think, last book, the episodes, the timeline of when he gives the scrolls over. So it has to be after Verity leaves, after he deciphers everything and then can sell them off to the Out Islanders. I mean, he could have been selling off some of the other ones already. True, definitely true. Yeah. Yeah. But at least like most of the other ones are gone after he after Verity leaves. Yes. Or at least all of them that can be sold are sold after Verity leaves. Right. Yeah. It also gives us a really good insight into how fearful, I guess, that Regal is. Yeah. That he there's this thing that he needs that he knows is going to give him unlimited power. And instead of asking for help, he takes years to decipher it on his own poorly because he is that far from trusting anybody. Mm -hmm. There's not one single person he has in his corner. So I think it's good to see that side of Regal. I mean, not that we didn't already know he was kind of a snake and like doesn't really trust people, but to see the depths of how much he has no trust for anyone is really interesting. And to see that the relationship with him and his half brother was also rife with no oh, trust of course of course it was they were raised by d- desire <laughs> true but i i just found that really interesting because i think i forget that they didn't have the best relationship in the world oh yeah, yeah. that there was still power plays happening between the brothers there that we weren't privy to because they were ultimately on the same side mm-hmm. so after regal finally ciphers out that meaning the fool is still telling Fitz what happened, and he says immediately Regal decided that Verity had conspired with you to seek that very power for himself. How dare he seek to steal the very treasure that Regal had worked so long to gain? How dare he try to make a fool of Regal in such a way? The fool smiled weakly. In his mind, his domination over the Elderlings is his birthright. You seek to steal it from him. He believes he upholds what is right and just by trying to kill you. And we kind of talked about this before, and we've both over, you know, passages and and chapters kind of had the question of like, why is he so single-mindedly focused on Fitz? And we've had conversations with each other saying like, he's kind of crazy. He blames everything on Fitz, but it is literally spelled out from his mind itself (laughs) by the fool that... He has deluded himself into thinking that Fitz is the cause of all his problems and does everything to conspire against Regal. And this is just the latest step of that. So he is really, Fitz is the nuisance. He is the one trying to tear down the Farseer birthright of this kingdom. And Regal is, of course, the most royal one of, out of all the brothers. So he okay. should be ruling anyways. But this little burr, this little fits trying to bring everything down needs to be eliminated. Yeah, it's a little wild. <laughs> Just it, a little bit. It, it, and it like doesn't make sense. It like shows kind of the crazy side, I guess. Just because the leaps of logic he has to make to keep fits in blame for every bad thing that happens in his life are so weird right like Mm -hmm. he sent verity on this quest he first of all got verity to marry a mountain kingdom woman and we know that he didn't mean for that to happen but it was his plan that went awry that caused this to happen right so that's on him but he doesn't think that way and then when verity goes off to seek help from the elderlings he is like, yeah, go for it, and sends them away with his graces and then makes fun of him and makes it this whole big thing until he realizes what was wrong. And then all of a sudden, Verity knew all along. And before this, it's Verity such an idiot. Now it's, oh, Verity knew the whole time and he's stealing my birthright. But Verity's his brother. So therefore, it's also Verity's birthright. Not, I guess, 
he doesn't see his brother as royal because he doesn't have as much Farseer blood in him. But it's still this weird, like, it's, I'm justified because it's only for me. This power is only for me. And well, Regal was brainwashed as a kid. Like, that's, right. that's why he's so sympathetic to me. And it, it, we don't see glimpses of that after the first book very often. Right. Because then Desire's out of the picture and we just see him as, like, the antagonist after the ending of the first book. But he really is sympathetic because he literally couldn't help himself growing up with Desire as his mother. Right. And Galen as his older half-brother. Right. But then he's not sympathetic because he continues to delve and dive down into the deep depths of (laughs) whatever he's gone into. Right. His delusions. Right. And it I don't know. I think you're right that there is some sympathy to be had there because a person who is making these logic jumps clearly isn't right in the head fully. <laughs> like it just doesn't hold up to real logic. He's excluding himself from any blame. It just, I don't know. So it's like sympathetic in that he has been taught to believe that there's no possible way he could ever do wrong. And there is sympathy to be had there because it isn't real. Like Everybody does something wrong in their life. And the fact that he has been brought up to believe that that's not possible for him, it really opens the opportunity for him to only become a kind of horrible person. (laughs) Because if you truly believe you never do anything wrong, then you can't get any better or learn from any mistake because you don't make those. And I don't know. And if something does go wrong, like... Regal sending Verity off on the trip or okaying that journey for the elderlings and then finding out later that that's what it that they're real right it's not his mistake it's Verity pulling a fast one over him right tricking him into doing that because clearly Verity knew about this secret thing that only he and his brother had access to the knowledge of and and Fitz himself says he knows that Regal fears and suspects anyone or anything he cannot control and that Fitz had been a double danger to him, a rival for his father's affection, and with a strange wit talent he could neither understand nor destroy. Because remember, Desire passed along her hatred of the other right. to her sons. And to regal every other person in the world was a tool or a threat. All threats must be destroyed. Fitz ends it with, He had probably never considered that all I wanted from him was to be left alone. Right. And I find that ending really interesting because Fitz does say that. And I think it was true at some point. Yeah. But also Fitz doesn't really back down from a fight with Regal ever. Like, <laughs> Not that I'm saying that he should just like stand by and get abused by somebody. He, he just... did early on until he started rowing. I, I distinctly remember a scene where Regal tries to jostle him and... Fitz just stands still and he can't like Regal can't move him at all. Right. And then (laughs) Regal kind of looks a little scared. Right. And that's when Fitz is like, oh. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, you're a wimp. Yeah. (laughs) No, but I find the like phrase that like maybe he never realized all I wanted was for him to leave me alone. But from Regal's point of view, I don't know. Fitz did conspire to take over the throne like right before he murdered people in his in regal's coterie yeah and yes it was because his father was murdered but why would he care about his father right he's looking at it looking at it from regal's point of view there is no yes but it's just fitz conspired and murdered some of his coterie fitz like (laughs) fitz is like in his way all the time he's always the one underfoot he got trained with a an assassin who murdered his mother right like right and so like (laughs) I don't know. While I do still think it's a little crazy of Regal, after hearing from Regal's point of view and then having Fitz be like, maybe he never considered I wanted to be alone. It's like, well, are you considering the fact that you did try to take over the throne? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like you were kind of conspiring to take over his place. So yeah, like, you didn't know that, though. That wasn't out until Fitz told Shade about it. Right. But I don't know. It just feels like. There were things Fitz were doing that were kind of very anti-Regal from the very beginning. And like, yes, Regal is delusional and things are not as deep. And obviously Fitz would not have made the choices he made if Regal was a half-decent person um, and didn't go out of his way to torture Fitz. However, 
Fitz isn't necessarily purely innocent in this, like, I didn't do anything sort of way. <laughs> like, there are things that Regal was kind of right about. It just doesn't feel that way to Fitz because hashtag Regal was right. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get justice for Regal. He is truly <laughs> the, the protagonist of the series. True. <laughs> I want to see some uh, some chapters from Regal's point of view here. Honestly, I would love Me to too. read from Regal's point of view. It, it feels like it would be very similar to Kenneth's point of view, though. Yeah, maybe. I can, I can see that. Maybe less smart. I <laughs> know that's kind of mean. I feel like Kenneth has like an intelligence about him. And even though a lot of times Kenneth is like walking into good fortune, Remember, though, remember, we always think that, oh, Regal's so dumb. He is super no, smart. Like, you're right. We always have to remind ourselves. <laughs> yeah. that... Regal is very <laughs> adept at scheming. I just think that, like... Turning everything to his own advantage. He's yes. Very good. So, so is Kenneth. Yeah. I don't know. So. I think there would be similarities, but I also feel like it's just more paranoid. Because Kenneth's a little bit paranoid, but I feel like... Yeah, it's Regal's, Regal's like... hyped up on the paranoia. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Well, thank you for tuning in and listening yeah. listening to us this week. If you have any thoughts or questions, or if you like the similarities between Kenneth and Regal, or think Regal's the best character in the whole series, please let us know. <laughs> if you like villains as I do, yes. <laughs> just let us know. Or it is fitshappy at gmail.com, or you can message us on any of our social medias. Is Fitz Happy on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram? You can go to our website, isfitshappy.com, and we have a bunch of links there to different places where you can listen to our episodes. You can stay on that website to listen to our episodes. You can rate, review, all those good stuff. Thanks so much for tuning in. Thanks. All right, so now's the time when you guys have skilled to us your thoughts, and we will read them aloud <laughs> to the unskilled. <laughs> Man, that's implying that we're skilled, which I don't know. We did keep a podcast running for 100 episodes. That's true. That true. feels a little bit skilled. <laughs> it feels just like determined. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what? That's what Verity was running on. So. <laughs> true, true. Just willpower. He did make a dragon. We have made a podcast. It's the same. There we go. <laughs> So this week we only have one topic to talk about, and it is about our question from last episode on what happened to the elderlings and yeah. the dragons, even. The remains of them. Yeah. If if they all died out in some cataclysmic event, why were there not remains somewhere in the cities or just anywhere for that matter? They kind of just disappear. And... We got some really interesting thoughts from both Ellen and Amir. Mm -hmm. And on Facebook, Ellen says that there was a passage further on in the books, which I actually kind of forgot about. So good call out, Ellen, that dragons do once in a while eat mm -hmm. uh, people as well to preserve their memories. Yes. It's like a high honor bestowed upon humans. However... And Ellen agrees with this. It doesn't really fit in with a cataclysmic event. Like, you can't just eat all of them. Right. <laughs> <You know>? like, <laughs> it doesn't really feel like something that, if it's this big high honor, they would just do for everybody. Right. Like, maybe they did eat some of the people, but I don't know. And also, all of the dragon remains are missing as well. There's right. no bones of dragons. And is wondering if Claris found and took those all in. Right. Or if they're just in small civilizations that are pretty far removed from other people's. Mm -hmm. So it hasn't really been talked about. Or they were flying around forever and got tired like Ice Fire. And Ice Fire was lucky enough to find a place that froze him over, but they just kind of crashed in the crescent, crashed in the ocean or land or whatever. And yeah, it's really interesting. So Ice Fire does make the comment that he's the only one left when he dives into the mountain. Mm -hmm. So potentially other dragons maybe took injury and so yeah. are not around. I also wonder if they would have crashed, like you said, into the ocean, if only to feed the serpents. Because if the serpents eat them, they'll still retain some of that memory, hopefully. Yeah. But I don't know. I feel like if it was 
a major cataclysmic event like is mentioned a few times that the land would be fairly uninhabitable just thinking back to like you know dinosaurs right or whatever anything like that major will kill out a lot of the animal life so they might have starved as well they might have just gotten too tired and eventually it's ice fire flying around the world a few times and being like well there's nothing left right and to be fair I think it is mentioned that dragons were kind of cared for by humans. Like, humans gave them, like, animals as sacrifice. Elderling cities and stuff. Yeah, yeah. which doesn't mean that they wouldn't be able to hunt on their own. But I do think if they're used to a certain portion of their diet being just given to them, and then they all of a sudden have to turn to fighting for every single meal against all of the other dragons, then it would be a lot harder. Also not knowing where silver is anymore. Right, and that keeps them growing and yeah, healthy. strong and everything so yeah the the missing dragon remains are also a big mystery here but a lot of the civilizations aren't as advanced as or or they're not forced into archaeology like the Rainwild traders right none of them are really digging up remains or cataloging historical events or anything people in the mountains don't care about the runes because right. There's no food there or good hunting. People in the six duchies don't care about digging up their history because they're too busy surviving raids and war right. against Chalcid. Chalcid is too busy building things with their slaves, you right, know, and yeah. making war on other people. Jamalia might, but we don't hear about them ever. Right. They're, I think the Jamalian people as a whole seem to be more scholarly. Yeah. And interested in the pursuit of knowledge, but that also comes from a place that is a little bit more developed and also isn't always on the brink of war. Mm-hmm. So they have the time to grow into that introspection of like, oh, let's find some things out. So so maybe there are like there is like a museum over there somewhere. Yeah, could be. <laughs> now that would be a chapter I would love to see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is. A, it's an interesting thought of where did those go as well? And then Amir chimes into this, talking about how in Assassin's Fate, the Elderlings all die because when as they're leaving Kelsingra, some of the outpost cities had mercenaries sent by the servants to massacre them. Mm-hmm. So at least we know that most of them died in that way. And then also there's the fact that even if some of them did survive, as per the Rainwild books... We know that a dragon is needed to, to shape the growth of an elderling child so yes. they don't die under their own malformed bodies. Yes, so they can't have children without the help of dragons, and with no more dragons, no more babies. <laughs> you can't keep a civilization alive. I am curious, however, if that's a fact of the new dragons. Because remember, the relationship with elderlings and dragons is definitely different in right. the Rainwild Chronicles than it is in the past. I don't know if because the Rainwild traders lived around those elderling cities for so long that they became malformed, and that was the reason why, or if in the past all elderlings who lived around dragons were like that, and then the lucky few got chosen to be bonded to a dragon and changed for the better. I. I'm really curious of how that works. I think it specifically says in one of the Rainwild books, I think the later trilogy, that the Rainwild people not being able to conceive regularly is a direct punishment for the treatment of the wizard wood. Right. So I think there is some correlation there. Um, But I don't know if that's something that like everyone had to suffer through back in the day like yeah yeah i yeah i know that's the reason why the current rainwild traders right have their fertility as it is and their their growth hindered but i'm really curious about how the ancient elderlings right like did they need the guidance of dragons to help them be formed perfectly or was it just kind of like Perfect. I don't know. Yeah, so that is really interesting because in the final trilogy um, with Fitz, when he goes to Kelsingra, um, he helps Rain and Malta's baby. Yes. And it makes Tatangula 
Is it Titangula that's their dragon? I yeah. think so, yeah. It makes her angry because... Somebody else touched the Yeah, somebody else kid. touched the child, but she also didn't come back to help the child well, yeah, grow. Yeah, because they're arrogant. And- right, but that makes... That, like, leads me to believe how much could the dragons have helped every single child that grew mm-hmm. grow because they have no concept of human time and children would have died unless this new round of dragon is less knowledgeable in how to keep the baby growing correctly at all times instead of needing to be there i feel like it's not so much i mean it could be definitely could be right. just in my mind i feel like it's not so much on the dragons not knowing things and it's more so on the different environment that these new elderlings grew up in that could be true too because they they were born with struggling organs and things like that they were born with these uh deformities as they call them and i am really really curious if the old elderlings were as well if like the the regular people in kelsingra were born with some of those irregularities because they're around dragons so much right or if it was because it was the wizard wood and like the dead dragons that they got morphed by in the rain wilds and like live dragons don't do that that's a good point i was just thinking about how tangulo is one of the two last real quote-unquote dragons Mm -hmm. because she was already in the cocoon and didn't need poor breeding grounds Mm -hmm. to turn into a cocoon so she has the memories needed and was formed by other dragons with more memories yeah instead of just two dragons (laughs) no she's the only one who creates the cocoons um, for the new set of yes. people. So um, maybe it is just different now how babies are. Maybe it wasn't as necessary back then. I don't know. Also, maybe the knowledge was greater by the people living there yeah, could be. of how things worked that they could help with, with the short intervals of help from their dragons. Mm-hmm. They could keep a child alive long enough to wait until the dragons come back. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Hard, hard to know because we don't get any of that history. I just want to know, you know, yeah. I just, I just want to know everything. <laughs> Give me an encyclopedia. You know? <laughs> I'd read through it once. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I wouldn't read through it. I'd take your word for it, but <laughs> it is one of the things that is hard to understand Yeah, because we have so much conflicting information. Mm -hmm. But that does make more sense because like I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast a long time ago, I haven't read the last trilogy for a long time. Mm -hmm. So I had totally forgotten that the servants had sent out assassins and they were, I I knew they were focused on culling a lot of that information. So it makes sense that they would eliminate the remains as well, just to try to completely genocide the elderlings from ever existing. Right. And the existence of dragons. So good thoughts, Amir. Thank you. Yeah. The last thing that Amir does bring up is in regards to our conversation about carving stone dragons. Yes. And the emotions that get fed into it. And uh, he just points out a couple places where we should keep our eyes on and events that do happen in the upcoming chapters. One is when Verdi directs Fitz's anger out of him and into his stone dragon. So I, I remember that once he brought it up that Fitz is like left feeling empty kind of hollow and like Uh where did that emotion go and then two was when the last trilogy when fitz puts his own deep shame over abandoning nettle and b multiple times into the dragon because it couldn't kill that emotion so amir also puts in parentheses it's heartbreaking which yes Yes. it is but those are those are two examples that off the top of uh, amir's head that he could remember that directly deal with emotion Right. So how that affects the dragon yeah. and being built. I'll I'll definitely look into that more because I know a lot of the emotion is put into Girl on a Dragon. Yeah. As well. So I'm interested in checking up on those. Yeah. Also, though, in topic of Girl and Dragon, I've been thinking as we go, it's really weird knowing how much is needed to build a stone dragon like what goes into the process and then having next book where fool gives fits his emotions back just willing because the girl on dragon gave them back to fool to carry and that's so strange to me because wouldn't that mean that girl on dragon would cease to exist in some form or she would 
become made a deal because doesn't she get the uh the crown which has like seven other people oh, living right. in it that's fair yeah i don't know how the fool would, or how the crown would go into the drag i guess they know they worked it out but it it I distinctly remember Fitz reviving the fool with the crown. Yes. Him taking it off or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. The fool giving the crown to Girl and the Dragon who puts it on and it kind of... I distinctly remember a description of it like turning into stone almost. Like it mm-hmm. melding into Girl and the Dragon and then gets the memories back. Okay. So See, I don't have as much memory of... That whole time. To be honest, I thought the whole death thing with Fool happened this book. And I was like, how is that going to happen at any point? This is, there's no. And then nope, I was like, oh, yeah, that is it's not. six books from now. <laughs> yeah. I get really confused on where things happen. <laughs> but thank you, Amir and Ellen, for both sending in some great thoughts for us to think on. So, 100 episodes, two-year anniversary. Happy anniversary, everybody. Came on the same time. That's awesome. I know. That's great. <laughs> 10 out of 10 planning, clearly on purpose on our part. Right. <laughs> what's, your, what's been your favorite book, I'll say, out of the three so far? I won't say episode because oh. there's too many to choose from. Okay, so I have to say this one. I think that this one has a really good blend of action and introspection Mm -hmm. that I think isn't necessarily present as evenly throughout the other two books, although the other two books are still really good and they are the start of a large trilogy. So it's not like there can be too much done, but this is such like a, a good book of all of the things coming together and the basis of our knowledge. I don't know. I like it a lot. I think the second one is still my favorite book, but the third one, I agree with you. This this last book has been nice to do as a podcast. I think it's my favorite <laughs> for the podcast. That's fair. Although introducing all the characters was super fun in the first one. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Well, soon we'll have more of that with yeah. the next book. Oh, geez. Yeah. Been doing this for two years. I know. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> We've been in two podcast studios, quote unquote, two bedrooms. Well, one that started out in a living room of our old place uh-huh. that was very big and probably a bit echoey. And yeah, now we have an office in our new apartment or old apartment, I guess now. <laughs> Depends on when you listen to this. Right. It's changed a lot, but I think we I've definitely changed a lot in how I've done things yeah. prepping for it. I used to make like sheets of notes and have questions and stuff. And now Mm -hmm. I just read through the chapter like twice and highlight things that I want to talk about. And I usually remember the questions. (laughs) I know if there I told Luke that my the way that I read the books or prepare for our episodes has evolved in that I have three reasons to underline something. It's either because I want to definitely read it or at least bring it up on the pod it's because it's a important supporting fact that I may need for later points. So it's not necessary to like read, but it is something that needs to be said out loud in mm-hmm. some capacity. And then one of the things that I find interesting, and then I will put my questions that I absolutely do not want to forget in the margins so that I know that at the very least the, the pressing questions that I'm having as I'm reading get here to you guys <laughs> yeah her books are getting all marked up yep and also i put really sassy comments and like <laughs> <laughs> and meme ideas in there so <laughs> it's a little messy i know what i'm reading but <laughs> same i i for my nook because i read them in digital that there's three different colors of highlights and i don't have a way I do it really I just I just highlight things and if it's a different kind of separated idea I might do a different color if there's too much of one color on one page I'll change it up a little bit you know (laughs) I just try to break up my idea so it's not a solid block of yellow on a page that's fair yeah I don't I don't do much uh note taking anymore once in a while I, I will still write stuff down but I don't do it on paper anymore that was taking up a lot of time I found and then I'll go back and edit everything. 
and put together stuff. I don't cut out too much, to be honest. Mostly just silence. Right. Some stupid comments we make. <laughs> I have this horrible habit of not knowing words. I don't know why. I just occasionally will be mid-sentence and it's gone. And I have no idea, like, even a context clue to give Luke to try to help. I just look at him and I'm like, She just looks at me and anything? shakes her head. <laughs> I'm just like, I don't know what you're trying to say, so I can't help you. Usually it's worse with names, like proper nouns, I guess, like names of places or people. Um, but occasionally it'll just be like the word walk. And I just don't. <laughs> I'm like, I don't even like... I don't know the thing, you know, the thing <laughs> just, people do just blanks out. <laughs> That's all right, though. So that kind of gets cut out, I think, mostly. <laughs> I have a very large audio file of things I keep cutting and pasting from various episodes throughout all of our 100. And it's just called, I think, like random in my file <laughs> system. And it's literally just sound bites of us either joking around or singing or whatever. Nice, nice. So those are hidden somewhere in my files. <laughs> I have to edit that someday and put it to release it. Yeah. <laughs> Some blooper reel. I think the main thing that's changed since we started is just, I guess, comfortability in front of a microphone. Yeah. Also, we do a little bit more joking with the mics on now to like get used to talking again mm. in front of a microphone. It takes, yeah, it does, definitely takes some getting used to, mm -hmm. and I'm definitely more comfortable, and I, I know you are more comfortable as well. I can hear it in your voice from, like, you know, episode <laughs> when we one started, yeah. Yeah, to now, <laughs> even, the, even the trailer itself. Yeah, I was very nervous. Cute little behind-the-scene fact. Um, I was super nervous. We wrote down a script of what we were going to say for the trailer because mm -hmm. we're like, well, we won't do this for every episode. It's just yep. this trailer is to be more succinct, make sure that we say what we're going to say. And it took so many tries for me to read my stuff. I was so nervous. I was like... I don't think I could do this. I'm not going to be able to talk. <laughs> yeah, you were you were having second thoughts about the podcast during yeah. that recording. <laughs> I was like, I can't do. I can't. I can't even read my own writing. How am I going to read <laughs> excerpts from the book? So, but I've also always had trouble reading writing out loud. So, this is a fun exercise to get better. A lot of practice now. <laughs> Well, 100 episodes. Our first episode came out on March 27th. Our trailer was March 19th before that, as we mentioned. And our first episode got 23 downloads. Nice. Uh, I don't know if that was the first day or the first, you know, three or four days that it was released in all of March. Mm -hmm. It's kind of hard to go back and, and see that without doing a deep dive. But episode 98, which came out, you know, two episodes ago now, as you're listening to this, had 222 the first week. Ooh. So we've grown quite a bit. Thanks to all of you out there listening. Thank you so much for supporting and liking. Yeah. Joining us on this journey mm -hmm. for telling your friends about us. <laughs> and overall, our two years and 100 episodes that we've released have gotten 47,800 downloads. Yeah, that's a ridiculous amount. Yeah. Or near in f uh, 50,000 for those. Yeah. It's uh, it's crazy to think about. We have a bunch of uh, people who follow along and, and listen to us and contribute in conversations. Twitter's kind of lagging behind with 97 followers, but we don't. <laughs> We're not very active on Twitter anymore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, Facebook has uh, 156 followers, 147 likes. And Instagram, because of Emma's meme game, has 570 <laughs> followers, which is insane to think yeah. about as well. It's so wild. I mean, just the fact that we get like 220 people downloading our episode a week now, like even if it hasn't been that long, it's so weird to mm -hmm. think about. Like 200 people is so many that yeah. I don't know. It's just wild. Podcasts it, are weird with their stats, so it might not be individual people playing it, you know, right. 200 individual people, because it could count twice if you download it on your phone and then you go to your computer and download it again to listen right. and pick up where you left off. But, but even if it's like 100 people, it's like ballpark. 20 people yeah. downloading our stuff is it's crazy. Insane, like, right? <laughs> like even just 20 people wanting to know what we say. <laughs> but yeah, it's like the growth that we've had has been really cool and interesting and scary a little bit. Just yeah. <laughs> that's a lot of people to talk to. There's a couple of other stats about you guys, the listeners here that uh, are 
host provides us and we can look at once in a while. Uh, I want to know what your thoughts, where do you think most people listen to us? Mm, I haven't looked at this since like I, yeah, a I, few months in. <laughs> so if I had to go based off of how things were developing when we first started, I feel like either Australia or... Oh, no, no, no. The, uh, not the, not the oh. location. The, uh, the software they use to listen to us. Oh, who... Yeah, oh, like no. what website, that sort of thing. Ooh. I'll do the location after this. Okay, sorry. Um, oh, if I had to take a guess, I'm going to say Spotify, if only because that's the only place I listen to. But maybe Podbean? Uh, Spotify is number one. Yes. It's 35% of people listen on Spotify. Then Apple Podcasts, number two. Google Podcasts, shortly behind that. Then Podcast Addict. And then Podbean. Interesting. And then there's all the other ones. Pocket Cast, Amazon Music Podcast, CastBox, Stitcher. All the way at the bottom, there are uh, a few people, at least least one download throughout all of our things on Spotify. Uh, Xbox <laughs> hey. and mobile Safari UI web view. So whoever's there's two others on Safari. So whoever's out there on Safari I think, and not Apple podcast, yeah, like shout out to you. That is actually really funny. <laughs> you, find, you found our website on Safari. And, and yeah. That, I love that. That's it's great. great. So yeah, that's a, uh, that's pretty fun to look at once in a while. And then as Emma was trying to guess before, we do have locations as well of where, about where people are listening and tuning Obviously, in Obviously, we from. don't have your addresses. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just <laughs> No <countries>. worries. <laughs> so where do you think that most of our audience comes from, Emma? Okay, I am tied between, I'm going to say Australia, specifically New South Wales, because that was big when we first started. And then maybe like uh, France or Spain. Interesting. Very Interesting. Because you're missing out on the United States. <laughs> well, which is... we did not have very many United States l- listeners when we started, so I have no reason to believe that we would have grown in that market. <laughs> it is 41% of our listeners. Oh, hey! Come from the United States. Hey, friends! <laughs> Followed up closely by the United Kingdom. Well, not closely. It's 13%. <laughs> and then 12% Australia, then 6% okay. Canada, 5% New Zealand. So top five, all English-speaking or mostly English speaking right countries and then it uh, dwindles down into a bunch of other stuff there so that's interesting Mm -hmm. okay well I was kind of right because Australia is up there Um, (laughs) but thank you wherever you're listening from thank you (laughs) and last but not least I like to do this once in a while or at least look at this once in a while on Spotify stats for us we get to see what uh, artists people are listening to that nice. listen to our podcast and i did skew this one year because my alarm used to be the beatles every single morning and i it was i have like three alarms so three times a day <laughs> the beatles was playing on my spotify and so the first time i looked at this it was like a lot of people there's like a big chunk of beatles listens happening and i'm like uh oh sorry <laughs> Well, maybe you're still skewing it because overall it's Taylor Swift. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Lynn Manuel Miranda. Um The okay. Beatles. Imagine Dragons and Leslie Odom Jr. So Lynn Manuel Miranda and Leslie Odom Jr., both from Hamilton. That was I think both of our yes. most played album last year <laughs> or two years ago. Two no, years ago. two years ago because yeah. Olivia Rodriguez was mine oh, this year. So uh Spotify. Inside, I think, was mine <laughs> from Bo Burnham. <laughs> nice, nice. So, but yeah, there's a, a lot of Taylor Swift, Lynn Manuel, Beatles, Imagine Dragons. Well, shout out to my fellow Swifties. That is from all time, so that could be I mean, skewed quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. The um, the last, I don't know, I think that's, I think it continues to update. It's, yeah, the last 28 days. Oh, hey, so, nice. Maybe you're not skewing with the Beatles anymore. People are just like the Beatles. Hey, it's not just your alarm. I I just like the here comes the sun as my alarm because it makes me laugh. Um. (laughs) And it's a lot closer on Spotify. Actually, United Kingdom has a lot of uh, streams for us on Spotify compared to the U.S. So nice. Interesting. Well, 
Great thought, taste in music, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> I thought some of that was pretty interesting. It's always fun to look at random things that don't really relate to our podcast, right. but also <laughs> kind of do. So, Also, here's a little fun fact about Spotify for you. Um, if you make a playlist, the artist of the song can see the playlist that you made. So whenever you like put songs in, they get notifications that their music is being put. I don't think it works for podcasts. Yeah. So they can see all the names and what other songs are being placed with (laughs) their music. Yeah. That's cool. Um, I don't know if many of them check it, but that's like a fun little fact about Spotify for you. So neat. I didn't know that either. Yeah. (laughs) Nothing to do with us, I guess, but that's my stats reel. At least I don't really have a, it was just kind of fun to look look at those and the difference between episode one and 100. Yeah. Thank you so much for everyone who has stuck with us that long. And thank you so much to everyone who has found us in between there yeah. and has caught up to this point. <laughs> it's awesome to see the growth, hear the interaction between everybody. And we're, we're seeing more conversations in between some commenters, which is great to see. Yeah. We like having community and I'm not super great about always answering people um, in a timely manner, which is not great. And I'm so sorry. I'm I will work on it as we continue to grow this podcast. But (laughs) um, yeah, I that's that's on me. That's one thing that probably hasn't changed very much. (laughs) But thank you so much for tuning in to us, listening to us week after week. And we're looking forward to hearing from you guys. Yeah. And thank you for keeping us on and rating us and just yeah it's we really appreciate all of the love you guys have shown us these past two years and we hope to keep you with us as we go forward 